All right, let's get started. Been waiting. Let's get started. Been waiting two years to say this. Welcome to Steel Design. They didn't teach this last year, so, so yeah. A um, couple uh, quick announcements before we get started. First off, the manual. Did everybody get the coupon code for the manual? Okay, all right. You do not need the manual on day one. Um, in fact, you probably won't need the manual for the first couple weeks. I give you some time to, to get it. But there will be a point when we start using it, and then we will use it like every day, okay? So you'll know when that point arrives, and just make sure and bring it. I know it's bulky, I know it's big, but you do need to bring the manual uh, pretty regularly. What? What? Okay. I'm 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 getting to that. I'm getting to that. I know. Yes. Please. <laughs> After class, I'll give you ten minutes. All right. Um, a couple other quick announcements, and I'll and I'll address your question because it's a good point. Um, I'm not going to be here on Wednesday, January 23rd, so class is canceled on that day. That's the Wednesday after uh, the holiday. So. Oh. All right. <coughs> okay. Um, the first homework. All right, hold on. Shh, shh, got, 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 got. Shh. The the first homework assignment is going to be assigned on Friday. So up until then, you're good. Uh, what we're going to do today, we're going to uh, talk about the course overview. Uh, we're going to talk just about some project development stuff in general, sort of recap some stuff from concrete design uh, that's relevant in here, and then get right to it. Okay, so let's first off, let's uh, go through just some general stuff with the, uh, the course and the syllabus and whatnot. Um, okay, let's talk about grading. So one of the things that you notice that I didn't do right off the bat, I didn't say, all right, let's get started. Let me pass out the att attendance sheet. Uh, I'm not taking attendance this semester, OK? You all are uh, grown adults, come or don't. Um, so yes. So uh, when did you still get No, 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 no. <laughs> no. Here, here's the grade distribution. Um, this might seem a little weird that exam two is worth less, but exam two has just connections on it, um, and it is somewhat of a, a, a shorter exam in terms of uh, content, so it's, it's just not as big. Um, in terms of textbook, uh, in textbooks, again, I don't require a textbook for this class, but I do require that you get the manual. I sent an email out to everybody sort of going through that. Um, one, a couple things about the manual. Uh, if you notice here on the top right, there's a little green star and it says tab notes. Periodically throughout the lecture notes, you're going to see this star pop up. Um, here, I'll even scroll ahead a little bit to sort of show you. Hold on. I'm scrolling way ahead. This is all the wind load stuff. Now I'm going to have to go all the way back. So like right here, okay, so this is the first one that shows up. Okay, so periodically throughout the, the presentation, you're going to see these pop up, and they're basically tab notes to indicate that you should probably place some sort of note or a tab in your manual for this particular reference. And there's a lot of them throughout the, uh, throughout the semester. Now, a common question I get uh, at the very beginning of the, uh, uh, at the ver very beginning of the semester is, well, can I see your manual to just go ahead and do them now? Um, I actually don't recommend that, and the main reason is exam one. See, on exam one, you're only going to need like three or four of these. But if on exam one, I, there's 20 of them, then that's 20 things that you have to sift through when you only needed three of them on the first exam. So we add to these as the semester progresses, so I, 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 genuine, I generally don't recommend that. I mean, if you're adamant, I mean, I'll let you see them, but I, but I, I just don't think it's necessary. Trust me, as the semester progresses and by the end, you'll have every tab that I do. So, uh, so yeah. But yeah, it's probably not a bad idea to get some sticky notes or something. Uh, I use this manual pretty heavily, so I got a label maker. I went all out on mine, but, but that's me. I, I use this a lot. Um, let's talk about attendance. 
Um, I, one thing I'm going to really, really, first I'm not taking attendance. Attendance isn't part of the grade. So you all are, 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 are grown adults. You know that I record the lectures. So if you miss a day, it is OK. It is not the end of the world, OK? The one thing I'm going, I, I have a couple requests, not one thing. First off, you know, I don't want you to come in 20 minutes late and then, oh, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, oh, oh, you know, let me get back through here, let me get back through here. Halfway throughout class, please don't, don't do that. You know, just show up on time. I mean, I, I, I mean if you're grown adults, then, then you should be able to show up on time. Um, if you've got something going on, like a you know, personal issue, you're sick, you're getting married, you're having an organ transplant, um, and you can't make it, uh, I, I understand. But, but just, just don't interrupt class. Also, like I said, I am recording the lectures, and that's uh, as a convenience to you. I just don't want to see the system abused. I don't want to see five people in class except for the day when homework's due, and then there's suddenly 48 people in the room. Um, let's not have that either, OK? So everybody good on that? All right, let me show you Blackboard real quick. Um, just so you are aware, uh, and I had this a similar discussion in, uh, in, in concrete design. Let me go into student preview. <coughs> so this is uh, uh, the, the page for SEAL design. If you go into course content, I've got the syllabus uh, uploaded. I'm going to pull that up here in a second. Uh, the YouTube playlist, obviously there isn't anything on it because I've I'm, I'm just started recording. But you all know the drill. I'll add videos as, uh, as I complete them. If you go into lecture notes and supplements, this is the class. Okay? This is SEAL design from beginning to end. Um, I have uh, all the lecture notes uploaded. I have the exam review slides. There's really only one supplement in here that I will be printing off, and that's the moment frame chart. And I probably won't print that off until uh, later on in the semester. Here, I'll pull it up and show it to you real quick. But basically, the, the, in order to use the moment frame alignment chart, you need a straight edge, and you kind of need it you know, like on your desk. Because you'll, you'll basically find a value on the left and find a value on, a lot on the right and strike a line. So you kind of you need a physical copy of that. But other than that, uh, everything's going to be uh, digital. One thing I, I will show you, uh, and this is a first this semester, but I uploaded two resources from AISC. They are the folks that write this manual. Um, one of them is the actual spec and the commentary. Uh, so if you're, just so you're aware, the specification and the commentary, if you look at the, the pages, you see this section that has all the gray? Everybody see that? So the co that's the commentary, and then the spec is all the, basically, hold on. Let's see. The code and the spec is basically all of this, like the commentary and then all the front matter before it. And that's a PDF uh, on, on Blackboard. You can download that from AISC for free. Um, I also downloaded the Shape database, which the Shape database is this super duper huge Excel file. And basically, that just contains all these dimensions and details. So you have them on Excel if you want. If you're wondering, like, well, why did I buy the manual? You bought the manual for all these design aids in the middle, which you can't really do steel design without. So, so yeah. Any questions? So homework will be assigned via Blackboard uh, and what have you. So, so just make sure you pay attention to that. Um, here's a copy of the syllabus. Um, not really anything in the syllabus that you haven't seen before and that isn't in the, uh, in the slides I just discussed. The only other thing worth mentioning is um, here is the schedule for the semester. Um, I did my best to try and reduce the conflict between steel and concrete. So for instance, if you're in concrete and steel, tests are on different weeks. And I tried to make sure that homeworks were not due on the same day. Um, that isn't always the case, but for the most part, uh, it is. But just so you're aware on exams, we have our first exam uh, on the 20th of February. And that sh we should pretty much hold to that schedule uh, pretty uh, rigidly. Um, as for our second exam, our second exam is right before, steel, or right before spring break. So we'll meet Monday for exam review, do the exam on Wednesday, and we probably won't meet on Friday. Whoops give you all a break, if you're OK with that. If you're that excited about steel design, we can continue to discuss. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, 
And so, yeah, so there's that. Um, let me close this. The only other things I will mention is, um, let me get this loaded up. Uh, so homework, um, you all know the drill and the, the schedules also on the uh, syllabus. Uh, it's, I say typically do one week after it's assigned, but really a lot of these assignments you get more time than that, uh, except for near the end because there's a succession of assignments and they usually do about a week afterwards. Um, the exams, there are three exams. They are not designed to be comprehensive. And I would argue of all of the classes that I've taught uh, at Marshall, um, this is probably the one course where they are the least comprehensive. Because this course is very modular in nature. You know, we learn about bolted connections, and then we move on. Then we learn about welded connections, and then we move on. And then we learn about columns, and we move on. And they are very modular in nature. There's a little bit of bleed over, but not much. During the exams, you can use the manual, okay? You kind of have to, so uh, you can use the manual. Uh, and you can have a formula sheet. You can put whatever you want on it except for worked out examples. Uh, you all know the drill. Um, the exam format, I might change that up a little bit just because I have so many students. You know, it might be a little different than what, I, what I've normally done. But by and large, this is a pretty typical Dr. Mike class, so. Any questions? I'm super excited to teach this. Doc, or, or steel design is the reason I'm Dr. Mike instead of Mr. Mike. So, so I, I, I love this stuff. So, any questions? Let's get right into it. Um, what I like to do for this first lecture, uh, and you know, I, you all have had me before. You you know uh, how how I go about things. Um, my first lecture, I usually like to set the stage for why you're in a given class. Like, you know, when you all took structural analysis on day one, I tried to explain to you why you're in the class. Well, I really don't think that I necessarily need to for this class. Um, I'll, I'll use the example I, I mentioned in concrete design. You know, for those of you that have had, uh, you know, internship experiences, co-op experiences, you've worked at the DOH, you've worked at a design firm, you've worked at the core. How many times have you been reviewing contract documents, reviewing material test data, reviewing drawings, and been like, man, I, I got to break out the IJK vectors on this. You got to do a dot and cross product on this. Has, has that ever popped up? No, no, it hasn't. Now, I'm not saying that that, that stuff isn't important. It is. Um, it serves as the you know, the conceptual basis for pretty much everything that we do in structural engineering and geotech and water, you name it. But we really don't directly use it in engineering. This stuff in here, this is civil engineering. I mean, this is literally the national specification for how to design structures with, with structural steel. This is it. We are, we are if there is any class here uh, where you know you took you said I learned civil engineering. This is civil engineering in a nutshell. This is this is, is very fundamental stuff. So I don't think I really need to go into why you're in this class. You, at this point, you should know. But I do want to talk about just some general stuff about project development, and then just sort of close the loop with some stuff that we talked about in concrete. So let's talk about structural design in general. You know, in concrete design, we talked about how we go about it. You know, and that's where you know, the concept of uh, reliability pops in, uh, the idea of allowable strength versus LRFD and, and whatnot. But let's talk about it a little more holistically, a little more 30,000 foot view. What are our objectives with structural design? Well, first off, um, we ought to recognize that when we're designing a structure, really our, the first and foremost demand that we need to meet is that of the architect or the client. As structural engineers, um, we generally work for the architect or client, but, but that can change depending upon the type of project that you're working on. For instance, if you are working on, let's say, the design of this building, the new engineering building here at Marshall, the structural engineer more than likely was a subcontract and was uh, uh, their client was the architect. You know, the architect is basically the go-between between the client and you as the structural engineer. You know, the architect has to go to Marshall University. I mean, Marshall University is a bunch of professors and administrators. You know, they, they 
generally don't know anything about structural steel design or reinforced concrete design. I mean, you know, the example I always like to use is if you're Geico Insurance and Geico needs a new corporate headquarters. Well, Geico doesn't care if the building's made out of steel or concrete or popsicle sticks. They, they don't care. They just want a building, okay? It's the architect's job to try and interpret their desires and their understanding and then turn it into a reality. But then it's our job to ensure that that reality, that that uh, uh, design is safe, that it is uh, able to resist the loads and demands that it's being subjected to. So that's where the structural engineer comes in. So we want to meet the demands of the architect and the client, obviously produce a structure that's at least uh, aesthetically pleasing. We want to obviously meet structural uh, strength and safety requirements. We also want to ensure serviceability performance. You know, a lot of times when we think of uh, structural strength, you know, the, the, the loads uh, less than the resistances, you know, granted, we spend a lot of time in here and a lot of time in concrete design talking about that, but things like limiting deflections, limiting vibrations, ensuring the day-to-day -day performance of the, uh, of, of the system, that's just as important. Ensuring that the system is able to be constructed safely, ensuring that the system is economical. These are very big components of, of what we as structural engineers uh, need to be able to achieve. You know, there's a famous quote by a guy named Hardy Cross. Uh, for those of you that have already had hydraulics, I know you've probably heard of him. I know I mentioned him in structural analysis. Uh, he's a famous, you know, civil engineer, and he said that strength is essential and otherwise unimportant because there's just so many other things uh, that we need to consider. Um, a lot of what, uh, what we're talking about here, we sort of indirectly even uh, uh, discuss and deal with in senior design because, you know, you're doing all this technical design, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff that you have to deal with, and we will have fun dealing with that uh, this semester in senior design. But I digress. Let's talk about, you know, the project delivery process from, a little, from, from that 30,000 foot view. So what's the role of the engineer and the consultant in a general structural engineering project? So usually the first step is just defining the project and planning it out. You know, if you're a, 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 a building design firm and you've been contracted or, you, you know, there's a, a project, I forbid, first thing, what are we doing? Okay, you, build, you need a building designed. Okay, what type of building? Is it an office building? Is it a skating rink? What, what is it? So trying to understand what the general function of the building is, what the layout of the building is, what, what are the design criteria? Is this just a normal office building or is it a lab where the deflection, where you've got this super high precise equipment and the deflections have to be so, so tiny that, you know, you have to maintain, you know, level of the equipment. I mean, there's a lot of different things that you, you need to discuss. We also need to discuss pre-contract uh, pre negotiations. You know, what's the schedule? When do we need to have this project done by? What's the fee? If I'm a civil engineer designing this building, I'd like to get money, I'd like to get paid. So what, what's the deal with that? Um, what's the scope of responsibilities? Where do my responsibilities as the structural engineer end? Um, how, what's the deal with communication? If I need information, if I uh, need clarification on a given point uh, on this project, who do, I, who do I talk to? What about contracting? Uh, you know, we have to enter that phase to ensure that there's an a, a understood agreement. What, my responsibilities are, what the client's responsibilities are, what the architect's responsibilities are. All right. <laughs> Usually the next step is to determine preliminary configurations and costs of the structure, you know, sort of defining the structural criteria uh, of, the, uh, of the project. This is where we start to get a little more into the nitty gritty details of the, uh, uh, of the engineering of the project, trying to determine loads on the structure. So. For instance, if the structure is in Miami, it's going to have, say, different wind loads than if it's in Casper, Wyoming. Um, what, what's the optimal structural type? This is sort of the alternatives phase. Ah, alternatives phase. Is this uh, going to be a steel building? Is it going to be a concrete building? My senior design folks know what I'm talking about. Um, are there any funky geotechnical requirements that we need to deal with? Is the soil profile really weird and we have to use you know, really odd uh, foundation or earth retaining system. Uh, is there any crazy earthwork that we're going to need to do to the site? Um, then once we sort of settled down on a final design, it's okay. Now we need to refine it and produce our drawings, uh, optimize the member selection, perform our final analysis, get our cost estimates taken care of, get the foundations designed. Then it's time to start 
uh, developing uh, uh, documents for, for the bidding process for the contractor. So structural drawings, construction specs, uh, looking at, uh, looking at uh, you know, developing your bid documents. Then it's time to get into contract administration to actually get the project built. So bid review meeting, you know, pre-bid meetings, bid review meetings, uh, and, you know, determining uh, construction inspection schedule, uh, all of that. Um, this plot right here is really, this is really the big point I want to get across to you. These two plots sort of complement one another. Uh, over here on the left, I have the ability to influence cost over time. So over here I have, let's say, the conceptual planning, I have the design, 90% documents, the construction documents, fabrication, erection, installation. Over here on the right is the cost of that change as a function of time. So let's take the conceptual planning. What, this, what these two plots are basically saying is that in the very beginning phases of the project, it doesn't really cost much to change your conceptual plan. You know, you've been given a project, you can have an idea in your head. Well, that idea can change and doesn't really cost any money. But whatever that idea is, is going to have a big influence uh, on the project over its design life. Okay? Whereas on the flip side, if the project is in the process of being fabricated, and you go, oh, no, we've got to completely change the, the frame. That's wrong. Well, that's going to cost a lot of money. Okay? So I, I think the big point that, that I'm trying to get across is those initial steps during the design process can have a profound impact on the very end. So really, you need to be uh, just diligent in what you're doing from, uh, from day one. Any questions? Now let's talk about design philosophies. I kind of just talked about this in concrete design, so a lot of you concrete design folks already heard this. And if you had concrete design last year, you definitely heard this. You know, um, you know, one of the very uh, uh, initial uh, things that we need to address in a structural design scenario is um, how exactly do we go about a structural design? You know, one of my famous examples is you know you have this table, you take it down to the structures lab because of course any day with controlled demolition is a good day. You break this table in half, it breaks at what 800 pounds. If I did that to every table in this room, would they all break at 800 pounds? No, there'd be a little bit of scatter, right? You know, there'd be some noise in that data. There are uncertainties associated with the resistance of a structure, just as there are uncertainties associated with the loads on a structure. Now, the way that we handle that uh, in the world of structural engineering is that there are two design philosophies. One of them is allowable strength design or allowable stress design, where we basically just use a factor of safety. Just, ah, factor of safety is two. We're just going to go with it. Um, in concrete design, that philosophy has pretty much been eliminated. In steel design, that philosophy actually kind of persists. And the use of allowable stress design is still employed to this day. And one of the ways that you can see that is to just take your steel manual and just start flipping through the design aids. So for instance, uh, like right here, I just open the steel manual and here's some design aids. And right off the bat, you know, you start flipping through it and you'll notice that there are a lot of these design aids have different colors associated with them. So for instance, there's green numbers and blue numbers. The green numbers correspond to allowable stress design, whereas the blue numbers correspond to LRFD. Now, you all know uh, from concrete design that LRFD is really the way to go because it offers a more scientific reliability-based approach to structural design. Okay? Um, the long story short for us is that we are going to be using LRFD in this course. So if you're ever using the green numbers, you're doing something wrong. Use the blue numbers. So, or the unshaded numbers. So, so yeah. <laughs> now, like I said, we're going to be using uh, LRFD in here, so probability-based approach. Um, one of the nice things about steel design versus concrete design is they use the same probabilistic models for loads. So from concrete design, you probably remember this, 1.2 times the dead plus 1.6 times the live, it's the same load combinations in here. So it's not as if you have different load combinations and different load factors for steel design than you do for concrete design. They are the same. 
um, they are based on that same probabilistic theory. Remember, uh, we can determine, uh, if we can determine the probability of our resistance and the probability of our loads, we can figure out, well, what are the situations where the resistance is bigger than the loads and the structure is safe? And then where's the situation where the loads are bigger the, than the resistance and the structure is unsafe? And remember, these load combinations is 1.2 times the dead plus 1.6 times the live. Remember, those are tailored, those load factors are tailored to ensure uniform reliability, that the area under the, uh, uh, the tail end of the curve uh, is uniform. I know for you concrete design folks, or folks that have already had concrete design, it's been a while since you've seen this. And if you're in concrete design now, you just saw this. So my big point in here is I just want to make sure that you remember this stuff and then we sort of move on. Now, <coughs> in LRFD, there are a total of seven load combinations. These are the, the load combination. These are all seven of them. The ones that are in red are the ones that we're going to use uh, most common. And really, either the 1.4 dead or the 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live, those are the load combinations that I really want you to, to remember. And really, the 1.2 dead plus the 1.6 live is going to govern more often than not. Okay? So, uh, so don't worry. In concrete, if, if you are in concrete design, we take those uh, uh, somewhat slowly, but if you've already had it, you've seen this stuff before. Okay. Now, what I want to do from here out, first off, any questions? Okay. What I want to do in here is this, is since I'm teaching both classes, what I don't want to do is uh, double up. I don't want to um, teach the same stuff in both classes because if you're taking both classes, I want you to get value out of both. So in concrete design, if you recall, we covered gravity loads. So like dead loads, live loads, remember live load reduction, remember all that? That was, uh, that was concrete design. In here, I'd like to spend some time covering lateral loads. So in other words, wind and seismic and earthquakes. So we're gonna handle wind and seismic a little, more, a little bit more of a detailed fashion in here. Now, First off, you know, you all know that there's a series of different uh, uh, load events that we consider uh, in structural design, you know, dead loads, live loads, snow loads, uh, what have you. And we get those loads from specifying documents like, like ASCE 7. Now, we're not going to use ASCE 7 directly, but I'm going to be teaching you the fundamental provisions from ASCE 7 that you need uh, in order to... Uh, uh, in order to assess lateral loads. And let me also say this with a caveat. I am giving you a little bit of a simplified version of lateral load assessment because lateral loads on structures can get real complicated real quick. So I'm boiling it down a little bit, but I just want you to be somewhat familiar with this stuff just so you're aware of what's going on. I mean, like just wind by itself can get really tricky really quick. So let, let's talk about lateral loads. So really what I'm after uh, in lateral load assessment is just to discuss each of these one at a time. There are two lateral load events that, we, that buildings experience, and that's wind loads, and that's earthquakes. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and we're going to handle those one at a time. Now, one of the things about lateral loads, and this is where lateral load design and gravity load design different, lateral load design really is one of the most challenging aspects of structural design period. You know, if I'm designing a floor beam, designing a floor beam on the second story of a building or the 82nd story of a building doesn't change. It's still a beam with loads going up and down. The design of the beam is exactly the same. But lateral load design is really a function of the building uh, as a whole. It, it, it can get really tricky really quick. Now, Let me give you an example. I like the picture. All right. So you're in a car, right? You're, you're in the passenger seat. Your buddy's driving. Your buddy can't drive to save his life. He hits the brakes. What's the first thing that you hit? Thank you. The first time I asked that question, they're like, the dashboard, the windshield, the pavement. Hopefully, you're wearing your seat belt. You only got that. Yeah, I know. 
Yeah. I know. I know. I'll stop. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Like the, let me let me explain what, what I'm talking about here. So, the idea is that is that under the I everybody, guys guys guys. All right. The idea is that under an under a lateral event in a vehicle, if you're going to fling forward, we install a system in that vehicle to prevent that motion. We call that system a seat belt. The point is, we do not design the entire car to hold you back. We only design that system to hold you back, right? We design the, the seat belt to hold you back. The same thing is true in building design. We don't design the entire building to withstand wind or earthquakes. We install a specific subsystem. How many of you all were, were able to see uh, the pharmacy frame being erected uh, here on Hal Greer, the, the new pharmacy building? If you were watching that as it was constructed, you probably saw some diagonal elements going between the beams and the columns looking something like this, right? Those were designed and placed specifically to hold the building up during lateral events, particularly when. Where we live uh, in the United States, we really don't have to deal with seismicity very much in our, in our location. But uh, there are regions in the country where seismicity is a big deal, where seismic risk is a big deal. You'd be surprised. For instance, if you're in western Kentucky, those uh, ground accelerations, there are some, some significant ground accelerations and they can control your design. So you know, I don't want you to think, oh, well, we're in West Virginia, we never have to worry about that. Well, yeah, but not too far away from here, you do have to worry about it. And if you're a design firm, design firms like jobs because job e jobs equal money. So they'll design buildings anywhere. There's nothing that says you can't design a building out in California. You know? So being able to understand seismic design is particularly important. Now, there, there, sorry, there are two predominant ways in steel design that we resist lateral loads. Uh, and that is through the inclusion of A, either a braced frame, so a braced frame uh, means actually including diagonal bracing elements to resist lateral loads. So, you know, whether those are X braces or just a diagonal brace or chevron braces that you see here, um, that's one way of doing it. Another way is uh, the inclusion of moment frames. Now, the difference between a braced frame and a moment frame is that a moment frame includes rigid connections that actually transfer moment between the beams and the columns. And there are advantages and disadvantages to either one. For instance, um, in moment frames, you don't have a brace, which makes the architect happy because there's no big thing in the middle of the wall. You know, if you had you know a big brace going from here to here, well, there's a space with no windows, no corner office with windows. The architect doesn't like that. But in all seriousness, braces prevent you know, either light or, you know, passage of personnel, so they, they can be a little bit of an issue. But brace frames are also generally cheaper. Uh, moment frame connections and the members that go along with them uh, tend to be a little beefier and a little bit more expensive. So whether or not you use a brace frame or a moment frame, it, it's not as simple as always go with a brace frame or always go with a moment frame. Economically, brace frames are always cheaper, but they're not always the best choice based on the needs of the client and based on, on just the general project. So you just need to be aware of, of, of how to use both. Okay. Is everybody okay with the difference between brace frames and moment frames? Everybody okay with that? Okay. All right. <laughs> now, like I said, uh, brace frames and moment frames are uh, generally uh, installed to withstand two different load events. The first one's wind. Let's talk about wind. Okay. First off, um, wind is the singular lateral event that all buildings uh, have to be designed for. It doesn't really matter where you're at. Uh, also, one of the reasons why lateral design is so complicated is because wind forces get larger as the building gets taller. Okay. The higher, the, the, the higher your, your top story, the larger the wind pressures. Generally, the way that wind pressures work is if you have a fairly short building, you assume a uniform pressure. So that's, let me see if you can see that right here. You have sort of a uniform pressure right there. And that, that height is around 15 feet. Once you get past 15 feet, that height just gets higher and higher and higher and higher. 
And so the taller the building, the larger the wind pressures. And so tall buildings, it, it can get pretty, pretty intricate uh, pretty quickly. Now, let's talk about wind pressure. So first off, this equation, this is the fundamental base wind pressure equation uh, that we use for, uh, for structural design. That equation may seem a little uh, uh, nuts, like where'd the point 00256 come from and all that? Where, where'd this equation come from? How many of you have heard of an equation or, or an expression called Bernoulli's equation? Well, yes, y'all, come on. Oh, goodness. It's going to be one of them semesters. Well, I, I propose, okay, all right, all right. I propose that this is just Bernoulli's equation. So here's, here's basically how this works, okay? You have a building, you know, we'll call this point B, and then you have a point here, we'll call this point A, and this is where, you know, the wind's blowing, right? Well, at point A, we know that the velocity equals whatever the wind speed is. We know the pressure equals zero, at point B, since the building is sitting there, we know that the velocity equals zero, and we're trying to find the pressure. So we plug it into Bernoulli's expression. We set the elevations equal to one another. The only question is, where does that come from, that point zero zero two five six? It's pretty simple. All it is is you take the unit weight of air, treating air as a fluid, and then you throw in a unit conversion. Well, then you throw in a unit conversion to take the velocity of the wind, you know, what's wind speed, miles per hour, take the wind speed in miles per hour, convert it into a pressure in pounds per square foot. And take that unit conversion and chuck it out, and you get 0 .00256. So that is the base wind speed equation right there. So never thought you'd see Bernoulli's in a structures class, did you? I can, I'm not doing a mic drop, this is expensive, so I'm going to do a marker drop. All right. There you go. Any questions? Now, <laughs> the, uh, the wind speed equation is, is dependent upon a couple of things. So first off, um, it is adjusted for, for a couple of different things. So there is a topographic factor that we adjust, the, that we adjust this for, this KZT. More often than not, that factor is taken as one. The only time that we adjust that is if the building, let's say, is on top of a really, really sudden steep hill, then you can get some wind speed up effects on the building. Uh, there's a wind directionality factor that's accounting for wind striking the, the, the weakest side of the building, but that's generally taken as 0.85 uh, for buildings. Uh, it, it, can, it can change depending off your, if you're designing a different structure. <coughs> The, wind, uh, the only other two factors to consider are the exposure uh, coefficient. The exposure coefficient, this is what changes the, the pressure as a function of height. The higher Z is, the higher your height is, the larger your wind pressures are. And then there's the base wind speed. The base wind speed is a function of where you're at in the country and what your risk category is. And we talked about risk categories in concrete design, but I want to refresh everybody. So, Risk categories go from one to four, and the risk category uh, is really a reflection of what your structure is being used for. So we have risk category one. Risk category one is a structure that's normally unoccupied and will result in a negligible risk to the public should it fail. So we're talking about barns, uh, storage shelters, you know, things like that. Uh, risk category three is a structure that houses a large number of people in one place. Um, and also, any building where the people inside would have a limited ability to escape. So we're talking about like a theater, like a lecture hall, uh, we're talking about prisons, we're talking about stadiums, we're talking about, you know, uh, 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 healthcare facilities, uh, you know, like a nursing home, things like that. Risk category four, it, it, m like this building, probably a, a risk category three. Uh, risk category four is a structure where the failure of that structure would inhibit the community. So we're talking about a hospital, you know, uh, uh, 911 centers, police station, fire department. That would be a risk category four. A risk category two is everything else, like a commercial office building uh, and things like that. 
So dependent upon your risk category, the way that we handle that in the spec is the higher the risk category, the higher the wind speed. Okay? So um, I'm actually, I actually want to show you how that works real quick because I think it's really nifty. Um, there we go. Okay. Sorry. So the nice thing about uh, the internet and about uh, structural engineers with time on their hands is um, a lot of the winds, the base wind speed maps have been digitized and have actually been integrated by, uh, with Google Maps. Uh, this organization, ATC, has done a really good job of integrating base wind speed maps um, for, for given locations. So, so for instance, here, here's sort of how they work. Okay, so we're at Marshall University. So. So let's, let's say we're at Marshall University. I just Googled the latitude and longitude of Marshall University. So here's the latitude and longitude, 38.4 some degrees north and 82.4 degrees west. What I'm going to do is I'm going to enter those coordinates. Uh, oh, what about coordinates? I'm going to enter those coordinates. So here's the latitude and here's the longitude. Now this is basically an XY coordinate system, so west is on the negative x-axis, so your, your, uh, your west coordinate, that's going to be negative. So when I search that, so here I am in Huntington, and here are my uh, risk categories and, and, and associated wind speeds. So if I'm designing, let's say, a risk category 2 structure in Huntington, West Virginia, I'm going to use a base wind speed of 106 miles per hour. If I'm designing a risk category 4 structure, that wind speed is going to bump up to, to 118. This also depends on where we're at in the United States. Just curious, where do you think wind speeds are the highest in the country, just generally? <laughs> the coast. Why the coasts? Hurricanes. Exactly. If you're, if you're designing a structure on the coast, generally your wind speeds are going to get larger because they're going to experience larger wind speeds due, due to hurricanes. So that's going to change dependent. Here, not that big of a deal. Is it up to about 15 feet that the wind Well, that's what, not really because that's what this is taking into account. Like if you look at the, the wind speed map, it vary accordingly. So. But your elevation is taken from ground level. Now there are, keep in mind, there are some regions in the country that are denoted special wind regions because of elevation or topography or whatnot. For instance, uh, if you know where Bluefield is, or Bluefield, West Virginia is, it's basically in a big valley. So there are regions that are classified as a special wind region because of the wind speed up effects that you get in that area. So. Just something worth mentioning. Any other questions? Now, don't worry if, if the details are getting you, because we're going to have a, I mean, you know me, we're going to have some, some examples going into this. <coughs> Wind pressures, again, vary as a function of the building's height. So the way that we determine that is we adjust that wind speed uh, by this, this term KZ. And the way that we compute KZ just depends upon the height of our building. So it's a function of the height of the, the story that we're looking at. Um, and then these two parameters, Z sub G and alpha, and they're dependent upon our exposure category. So one of the things you said was sea level. Sea level isn't really as big of a deal when it comes to wind as the exposure category. For instance, if I'm designing a building in the middle of Manhattan, well, that building is surrounded by a bunch of other buildings. Okay. So they can sort of act a little bit as a windshield. Whereas if I'm designing a building, let's say, in a rural you know, area in the middle of nowhere or on the coast, that's just going to mean a different exposure to wind altogether. Th does that make sense? So that exposure is, is really what's more important than the elevation. And the base wind speed maps sort of take that into account. Does that make sense? Anybody have any questions on that? All right. I, sorry. I have thrown a lot of um, 
a lot of details at you, I know, especially for the first day. It's okay. Don't worry. We're not getting into any super deep examples, but what I do want to do is um, starting Wednesday is I want to actually exercise how we would compute um, these, uh, uh, how we would compute these, these base wind speeds and, and or, or sorry, base wind pressures. One thing, uh, I don't know if this matters, but I am using my tablet, although I am still going to do the problems on the screen like I have in previous uh, semesters. See, because I have a tablet, I can use OneNote, like watch this. That's just cool, you know, sorry. It has nothing to do with anything, but I'm still doing it. All right, that's all I got. I would say give me back the sign-in sheet, but I didn't pass one out, so. We'll see you Wednesday.